Today we talk about one of the biggest messes uh, that exists in modern criminal law, which is mens rea that's derived from the common law tradition. Now the common law tradition means back to uh, English common law, but nowadays is codified into statutes and is not just a source of judge-made law anymore. Uh, so, you know, roughly half of our jurisdictions in the U.S. Uh, use some form of the common law tradition for mens rea, uh, as opposed to the model penal code tradition, uh, which is a little more recent. I guess it's not yet a tradition. Uh, and uh, this is something that requires you to think about language and the lessons we've learned so far about statutory interpretation a little bit differently. Um, so, you know, there are some... Uh, authors and uh, scholars out there such as Joshua Dressler who writes uh, a wonderful supplement that I recommend and also has his own casebook in this area and I even use his criminal procedure casebook uh, when I teach that course and, and he believes that common law mens rea is such utter nonsense that he doesn't want to propagate it anymore and doesn't want to uh, have it taught uh, and is part of his uh, course design um, including how he treats it in his own casebook. I'm a bit more of a, a pragmatist, although I agree uh, with his conclusion that a lot of our doctrine here is, is incoherent, confusing, and lacks a justified foundation. Uh, it's still used uh, widely, and as a result, we need to understand uh, how we should approach it. And so the, the purpose of this section is to give you some of the basic tools uh, for analyzing common law mens rea, but not a complete story or uh, list of, of exercises or problems that are resolved um, through common law mens rea, because in fact, that's just, that could be a whole course unto itself. Uh, so you see here on the slide, uh, a return of our favorite Israeli hard rock band represented by four of them um, staring off into space. And uh, uh, the reason for them here is uh, we're going to focus on uh, some different uh, levels of mens rea in the common law tradition. So uh, we see here, we'll label this guy specific or specific intent. Uh, this one will be general, general intent. Over here, we have strict liability, and then there's really no fourth standard, so we're just going to get rid of our fourth uh, member of mens rea for purposes of this. So we're concerned with three different levels here, specific intent, general intent, and strict liability, which means no mens rea need be shown at all. And I'm going to walk through some basics with each of these standards, expanding upon what's in the text, and then go over a couple cases. Okay, so one of the things that we're doing right away, you should realize, when looking at common law mens rea, is the specific words that are used, like knowingly, unlawfully, feloniously, maliciously, they're not going to matter in a sort of literal interpretive sense, meaning that you can find the word, look it up the dictionary, and you got your answer. Yeah, the meaning will matter from time to time, and we'll talk about that. But for the most part, you should be treating these words, many of which you think you know what they mean, like knowingly. Uh, treat them as a foreign language, as something you just don't understand and approaching them anew. Uh, this will help you navigate uh, common law mens rea a bit better because this explains why we need to use things like general and specific intent rather than just defining words. Defining words is how the model penal code approaches things, but the contrasting approach here is we're going to use... Uh, uh, instructions to jurors that aren't so much focused on the literal definition as in how to instruct them uh, to deal with things like mistakes of fact or intoxication. Okay, so uh, specific intent, and, and I press, I didn't make this meme, I don't know who did, but I just couldn't not use it. Um, specific intent and general intent, the distinction between the two categories, uh, matters in two ways. Uh, one is mistakes of fact. So for each standard, for each rule, we have a different mistake of fact instruction goes to the jury. And the second is, it matters when a defendant is intoxicated. At least it does in some jurisdictions. I'll break down that rule a bit more. Now, you might already be wondering, even after I read this, well, what, is it, what does specific intent mean? What does general intent mean? What are the definitions of these concepts? Don't try to define them. The, the definitions that exist tend to just confuse you, and they're not accurate when you look at them on a systematized basis. It's better to just think of specific intent to say blue or red intent. And then we can think of general intent as, as purple or green intent. In other words, these are just two categories that are largely arbitrarily constructed. Um, but then over time, 
they there's certain things we put in one box, say our green intent, and the other one we'll put in our red intent box uh, for various policy reasons, historical reasons, and so forth. So don't read anything into the word specific in general. It will just lead you astray. But intoxication is something that matters as illustrated here in the meme. Um, you know, general intent to the degree it's defined uh, is often just everything else, not just specific intent. And that's what I mean to indicate these two categories. Although they have historical traditions associated with them, the word specific in general will mislead you in distinguishing them. Okay, so the first way uh, that these two standards are important is telling the jury about mistakes of fact. Well, what do we mean, first of all, by a mistake of fact? Uh, we mean that the a, an individual was mistaken about some fact in the world. Not mistaken about the law in its meaning, but mistaken about some real-world empirical fact. And so when you start in a, a common law mens rea question or problem in this course, uh, the first thing you need to think of is, is, is there a mistake of fact? Um, and the second will be, is there intoxication? Um, these are the, the two sort of questions that trigger the rest of your analysis, where you, you start by going, okay, yeah, the defendant seems confused about something here. The defendant seems to not understand uh, what's happening. And so the first case we'll talk about soon is, is Green versus Texas. In that case, the defendant, how would we characterize the mistake of act? I thought those hogs were mine, or at least I didn't realize they were somebody else's, right? He slaughters his neighbor's hogs. He thought they were his. That's a mistake of fact. It's a mistake as to some fact of the world. Who owns these hogs? Are they his hogs? Are they someone else's? So that's what we mean by mistake of fact. So in a specific intent uh, crime, we tell the jury uh, that the burden is on the prosecution to beyond a reasonable doubt to establish that a defendant was not honestly mistaken. So it's just honesty we focus on here. This is what we call a subjective test, meaning all that matters is this particular person's view of the world and the facts as they understood them at the moment of the crime. And so that's what we tell jurors. The burden's on the prosecution to prove there wasn't an honest mistake here. Um, in contrast, for general intent crimes, uh, the, the prosecution has two different paths uh, to a guilty verdict. They can follow the same route, which is saying that the defendant was not honestly mistaken. But they're also given an opportunity to use an objective standard, a reasonable person test, which is if a, the defendant was honestly mistaken, they could show instead that that mistake wasn't reasonable. It wasn't a mistake that a reasonable person would make. And so we'll talk about how these standards get applied as we go through the cases. But for now, it's just important to recognize specific intent is a subjective test. General intent is an objective test, although you can also prove it subjectively as well. Okay, so Green versus Texas is our first basic fact pattern. It's an old case from Texas, but it just, it really distills the question uh, nicely to its basics here, right? The, the defendant here uh, is arguably, possibly, just there's reasonable doubt that they are confused uh, when they uh, slaughter uh, their neighbor's hogs. So this is in some sense very similar to Morissette. Right, we have a theft by conversion. In this case, instead of converting metal to crushed metal, uh, they're converting live hogs to dead hogs. And that uh, takes the property of another. The act requirement is met here. Right, This is undoubtedly uh, a criminal act. The question is, is there criminal mens rea? And there, uh, at least at the trial level, uh, the, the judge made a mistake. They, they did not issue the proper mistake of fact instruction, uh, which should have been specific intent. Uh, but the mere fact is some instruction had to be issued here. They had to tell the jurors that if a defendant is honestly mistaken, if there's a reasonable doubt that they're honestly mistaken, you need to return a not guilty verdict. And if that's not done, uh, then the conviction needs to be overturned and it needs to uh, be retried. Um, and here... Uh, we don't care necessarily what a reasonable person would think. Uh, it would only be a subjective standard. And so let's think about how that could matter, right? In other words, what, if we had a specific intent instruction versus general intent instruction, could it change the outcome? Well, let's say, you know, I don't know much about actually how hogs in this particular time in Texas were uh, bred and cared for, but oftentimes with livestock, they can share runs or common property that's not fenced in. This is true when there's like water holes or places for them to uh, roam freely or relatively freely. Um, in that case, uh, if the hogs were intermixed, well, we might say 
uh, that both subjectively it made sense that this defendant was mistaken or objectively a reasonable person might uh, in this situation also make the mistake. But what if, in fact, they're not run separately and, in fact, every hog is branded in the same way many livestock are, meaning there is some uh, mark on them from a burning metal brand that's placed upon them. And if our defendant, say, slaughtered 50 hogs, all of which did not match their brand, well, then we might start wondering, right, and say, okay, even if subjectively there's a reasonable doubt that this defendant was honestly mistaken, is that something a reasonable person would mistake given what we know about branding and given that the hogs are usually separated? And so, yes, we, we think jurors might uh, reach a different uh, conclusion based upon the standard. And certainly if it were strict liability, meaning that there's no mistake effect instruction, that, that the government only has to prove the act requirements, then Green is in big trouble, right? He should be found guilty because he had committed the criminal acts here. So this is a pretty straightforward example of how mens rea matters and which standard we could use under the common law tradition. Now, as I said, theft statutes are specific intent historically, and that's part of the reasoning that largely I've edited out in Morissette where Justice Jackson looks through it and decides that's what the appropriate standard is for that case, but also here in Texas and Green that specific intent is the standard because that's what it is for theft statutes, and as a result, our defendant should have been given that proper mistake instruction at trial. Okay, so that's that's a basic rundown of mistake effect instructions. Now let's talk about intoxication. So intoxication gives me a chance uh, to include many um, uh, slides of celebrities who are drunk or appear to be drunk. In this case, it's Dirk Nowitzki and Steve uh, Nash. Uh, so why? How does intoxication factor into the law here? We've dealt with it once before with voluntariness, and it was only at an extreme level of intoxication that it might create involuntariness through an impaired consciousness. But now we're dealing with it from a mens rea perspective. And it does seem that people who are intoxicated, in fact, many of our, our criminals are intoxicated at the time they commit a crime, that it does affect their thought processes. It affects their ability to understand what's going on around them, to process information. Um, but we know that it, it, it would seem strange if basically being drunk or being intoxicated was a get out of jail free card. Um, and so how does it how does it work here? Um, well, it turns out that even among common law jurisdictions, there's a lot of split and variation uh, on how the standard applies and how it should be um, used. So let's start with the easy situation, which is general intent. If a crime is general intent, then a defendant's intoxication is wholly irrelevant. It cannot be used to mitigate mens rea. And this sort of logically follows when you think about what general intent is. It's an objective test. And we tend to think, or we should think maybe, that a reasonable person is sober. And so if we're holding someone uh, up against a reasonable person standard, their intoxication shouldn't work in their favor, right? It shouldn't be something that helps them escape criminal liability. So that's our easy situation. General intent, you can just write off the intoxication in terms of a mens rea analysis. But what about specific intent? Well, again, this is a complicated world we're in here. Um, some jurisdictions, and we're, we're dealing with about half of our common law jurisdictions, which is around a quarter of our states, uh, do consider uh, intoxication to mitigate specific intent for crimes uh, in some circumstances. Now, the some circumstances is a little more complicated. Uh, you'll notice in our Florida versus Frey case, they talk specifically about premeditation, which is related to homicide. We're going to leave that aside. We're just going to say about half of our common law jurisdictions think intoxication nullifies specific intent. Uh, and, and well, again, this kind of logically follows. If we're, if we're following a wholly subjective rule, um, yeah, at that moment the crime is being committed, somebody's intoxication and the impairment that results from it uh, would mean that they're more prone to, say, make mistakes of facts, more be confused about what's going on. And so it can be relevant in a uh, specific intent crime in some uh, jurisdictions. However, that doesn't even solve our issue because even amongst those um, uh, uh, jurisdictions, Sometimes intoxication is treated as what we're going to call an affirmative defense. Affirmative defenses are things where at least one of our burdens, and we'll talk more about burdens later, but in this case, the burden of persuasion uh, shifts to the defendant, meaning that the defendant has a... Uh, 
uh, has an obligation to show by a preponderance of evidence, by just over 50% of the evidence, that their intoxication inhibited their mens rea. Okay, so why am I showing this crazy uh, slide here? Well, the reason the burden of persuasion, um, or at least one of the rationales we can use for why you'd shift the burden here on intoxication, is sometimes when we look at the conduct of another from the outside, it's difficult to know. Are they intoxicated? Is that just how they are normally? Or are they just a bit crazy? And so, uh, you know, here we might look at, uh, you know, our, our slide and say, is she, is she drunk? Is, is what's going on here? Um, and so to get over that, that difficulty of inferring intoxication, um, because the defense has no obligation to disclose the level of intoxication, they may not even have to testify um, in an ordinary case. And so it's, rather than having the prosecution prove beyond a reasonable doubt, that a person's intoxication wasn't uh, sufficient to mitigate their specific intent, at least uh, half of our juris or round half, I should say, of our jurisdictions that do apply uh, specific intent intoxication arguments allow them. Uh, so what we're dealing with here at the end is probably around five jurisdictions shift the burden to the defendant. And so, yeah, that's a, a subtle, subtle difference here, but it affects how we evaluate the evidence because the burden being on the prosecution beyond a reasonable doubt is much more difficult than the burden be for the prosecution than if the burden is on the defendant by a preponderance of evidence. Okay, now that we have the basic rules here, we get Frey versus Florida. Um, this case is remarkable in, in many levels. Uh, one is, I note in the discussion question, we'll talk about details, just how much more time is, and, and effort is spent here by the concurrences and dissent than the majority. The majority opinion is very straightforward um, and just kind of thinks this is a really run-of-the-mill case. And this is the High Court of Florida with a lot of judges with different views. But another thing that's remarkable about it is that a lot of the judges here seem to agree that specific versus general intent and the distinction between those two categories and the relevance of intoxication evidence, those are things that should be reconsidered, that Florida law may not be the best here. And yet, the majority of them is more willing to just say, well, that, let's save that for another case. This isn't the time. And I want to, you know, be a little critical of that because this is kind of their job. <laughs> um, you know, the fact that it wasn't briefed below in, in lower courts, well, yeah, it would be a frivolous argument below because these, in fact, are the standards. And there, there's no reason for them to waste time or effort to argue that you should abandon the difference between specific and general intent. And in this case, these are products of judge-made law. I mean, th these are judges came up with these categories. And as the 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 one of the opinions notes, even the intoxication, the relevance of intoxication evidence is a product of judge-made law. And so if anyone's going to cure it, it's, it should be these judges. And, and just to keep punning it for the future is hardly a satisfactory resolution. Now, the facts of the case are pretty straightforward, right? We have Frey here, who has an astounding blood alcohol level of 0.388. Uh, maybe he has a high tolerance here. Um, and uh, our officer, Deputy Britt, is trying to uh, serve an arrest warrant um, that's outstanding and tries to handcuff Frey. And Frey's not going to have that. He out, has outbursts here. Um, he grabs Britt's throat with both hands, choking him. Um, but perhaps because he is so drunk, um, you know, he doesn't succeed in his efforts to escape uh, Deputy Britt and instead ends up being shot in the legs. Um, and so Frey, you know, he's He's kind of had a bad day here, right? Because uh, he, an outstanding warrant's being served against him. Uh, he, they try to handcuff him. And uh, ultimately, he, he in fact commits more crimes by trying to resist arrest here and ends up being shot, uh, all for good measure here. Um, so he's being charged with aggravated battery and resisting arrest with violence. Now, one of the, the oddities in this case that you probably won't appreciate, but I want to know is that Florida law, this is considered to be a general uh, intent crime, um, although the resisting arrest with violence, I'm sorry, I should say the, the um, aggravated battery is a, a general intent crime, where the resisting arrest with violence is a specific intent crime. And so he asked for instructions on uh, the resisting arrest. And in fact, aggravated battery in other jurisdictions is often specific intent. So this again shows there is some arbitrariness to these categories, even as we try to divide meaning from them, uh, because assault and battery historically have been specific intent crimes. Uh, but the relevance for this specific case is it means that, that there should only be an intoxication instruction on one of the crimes, the one that is specific intent. And Florida is one of those states that thinks uh, intoxication 
can diminish it. And so at the end of the day here, um, the, the question uh, before the court um, is such that whether or not, you know, uh, the, the trial court below properly administered the instruction only applied to resisting arrest and, um, with violence uh, or whether or not uh, there was error. And you'll notice they don't, the majority does not want to reconsider general versus specific intent, does not want to consider intoxication, even though we then get a bunch of concurring and dissenting opinions that do think, you know, there's something wrong here. And in particular, Judge Anstead's concurrence in parts and dissent in parts, I think, is quite helpful in showing that there's widespread scholarly opinion that these categories are not really the best, um, that they have long outlived their usefulness, and that we should be, you know, following a different approach here. And they go through what other high courts have said as well, right? New Jersey, you know, they quote an opinion there. They look at some other states. And so at the end of the day here, um, this is often the outcome in, in states that follow the common law tradition with intoxication. This is they recognize that this isn't necessarily the best way to go, but they don't want to fix it. Now, in truth, if the legislature has given uh, clear guidance here, the court would be should follow that, right, and draw a normal sort of separation of power. So if the legislature had said intoxication is only relevant in certain crimes or specific intent crimes, that would be a situation where the court would understandably agree. But what happens is, is the legislature just don't seem inclined to fix what many of the judges and practitioners think is a is not a, a good rule or a good set of rules, and the judges don't either. And so it just inertia has a power for powerful effect here in continuing this sort of trend going forward. Okay, so that's an application of our intoxication rule. Um, then we get to a second case where you know there, there's less discussion of the rule, but it's it's helpful for us to think about um, you know in terms of how intoxication should work. Now this ends up being a, an opinion by now Justice Gorsuch, even though I've I've been teaching it well before that, so it is just sort of a coincidence that he is now on the High Court. Uh, this is when he was writing an opinion at the Tenth Circuit here. Okay, so this is. Again, a fact pattern that on one level is very straightforward, but there is a subtlety that's a little different than Frey. Uh, so Hernandez, Hernandez, in case you were curious why we have the same name hyphenated twice, um, you might think, why didn't they just keep the same last name? Well, actually, this is uh, fairly common in Mexico and other countries to use hyphenated last names. It's a much longer standing tradition than in the United States, and it even includes when two families are merging with the same name. So that's why we have Hernandez, Hernandez here. Um, you know, Hernandez, Hernandez has... Um, uh, been excluded from the U.S. We've talked about that with some of our cases before. Um, and he is a Mexican citizen. Uh, he's been deported twice there. But on this given day, he had a lot of alcohol and smoked some marijuana as well and seems to have blacked out. And so when he awakes, he's in the U.S., and he doesn't know how he got there. Now, there's been a plot device in several movies, although often from a U.S. movie, the U person ends up in Mexico. But a border crossing while under the influence is, you know, it can happen. <laughs> Not saying it's excusable, but it, it can happen. So uh, at trial, he wanted to say that his voluntary intoxication, right, his consumption of these intoxicants, uh, meant that he lacked the mens rea for the legal entry into the United States after its exclusion. Now, this is at the federal criminal justice system, which follows the common law tradition. So uh, should he have been allowed to introduce evidence to that effect? Now, uh, the court here does say that, in fact, you should be allowed to use voluntary intoxication evidence to negate a specific intent crime. And this does appear to be one. Um, but there is the court's not very inclined to to give the instruction in this case, um, and and that's where things are a little tricky. Now, intoxicants have, and alcohol consumption in particular, does have two effects on this case. They're operating in different ways. One is the defendant's trying to argue that intoxication meant they lacked the mens rea. The other way is. Intoxication has created a poor evidentiary record because Hernandez, Hernandez can't actually testify or give information about how he got there because he doesn't seem to remember, right, if we assume he is credible. And as a result, um, 
that creates a, a problem, right? Because the government actually is not sure. Did he, did he walk? Did he take a bus? Did he drive? Um, each of those methods of crossing the border might tell us something differently about the mens rea of our defendant here, right? How he got there, the, the length of the journey. In fact, I, I will say one thing to be critical of in this case is we get very little information uh, about the distance uh, traveled. Uh, you can actually look up the town where he's discovered and see how far it is uh, from the border. Uh, and we might, you know, therefore, by looking at Columbus, New Mexico's relative proximity, have different theories about it, but we don't know. Um, now, the burden is normally on the prosecution to show uh, mens rea and the act requirements. And certainly they can say the act requirements, he did cross the border, right? Um, you know, the intoxication here is voluntary. We might wonder if the crossing of the border is voluntary, but we don't have any evidence either way here. But again, the burden should be on the prosecution. And so if this were a specific intent crime, it seems like Hernandez Hernandez should get a jury instruction here that that at least allows him to argue his intoxication meant he was honestly mistaken about crossing the border or he was so impaired that he didn't intentionally cross uh, the border here. Um, but... Uh, if it's a general intent crime, well, then the evidence isn't relevant at all. Um, and so uh, what we see from then Judge Gorsuch here is a, a walkthrough, much like now Justice Sotomayor's in Figueroa, where they walk through, should this be a specific intent? Should this be a general intent uh, crime? And then that will decide whether or not the evidence is admissible. Um, and, you know, that I think here is, is helpful to see, right? Again, we see this process um, and how the intoxication evidence uh, fits it in, into that category. Um, but I, I want to say, Judge Gorsuch, maybe there's a there's a subtle, um, I don't know, it's not quite a magic trick or something, but there's a hand-waving of, of the issue in some way. Um, he kind of conflates the two ways that alcohol's operating here, right? One is a way to negate mens rea, and one is, is the blackout lack of evidence. Because just because he blacked out, um, doesn't really tell us for certain anything about his, his mental state because, in fact, some people could still be very functional even though they blacked out, right? The threshold for blacking out isn't necessarily the same as the threshold for um, losing your mens rea. And so at the end of the day, I think Orsich is kind of like, well... You know, there's there's not any clear story or evidence here as to how he crossed the border, and so he defers to the jury verdict and, and upholds the conviction. But I do think uh, that that is, eh, and I guess it's the district court's decision here as opposed to the jury's deferring to, but the, the analysis is maybe a little more pragmatic than it is strictly doctrinal um, because there just is an absence of evidence here. And it seems like Hernandez might have raised some doubts here. Um, certainly, voluntariness, maybe not so much. Uh, but how is intoxication impaired uh, his his border crossing here, which was illegal? Um, but yeah, it's it's there's this is a tougher case. And you notice that Gorsuch just seems to be critical of the comments or, or the categories of general and specific intent. So quoting from the opinion, in the past, we admit the mental elements associated with Section 1326 were sometimes shrouded by reference to vague concepts like general and specific intent. Um, and it said in this area, we follow with the Teague Doctrine. And they mentioned the model penal code, even though that's not applicable. And rather than persist in employing opaque common law labels, that some signs blur the line between distinct mental elements. And so one thing that, that's different between uh, the Hernandez-Hernandez decision and the Frey court is that I think Gorsuch is more inclined to say, listen, there, our intoxication rules don't make a lot of sense. In this case, we're not finding for the defendant, but we're not going to focus as much onto the strict division between specific and general intent to resolve these things, even though it is part of our overall uh, um, set of rules uh, for deciding these cases. So common law mens rea here is, you know, as I said, a bit of a mess, and it's not super clear. Now, I'm going to stop this lecture here. Um, we'll get next time to a, a specific uh, unique category to common law mens rea called public welfare offenses. It was already in Morissette and Figueroa, but then we'll deal with a case that actually fits within that. So I'll stop for now and continue next time with more common law mens rea.